Hi, in a previous video titled Pro Tournament Stringing Part 1, I shared with you what it's like. In this video, I invited my wife Heather to share our full experience. Well, there she is now. Hi, everybody. Let's go to Maui. Okay. All right, so we're here on Maui and we're headed to the Royal Lahaina Tennis Ranch, the site of the pro tournament that Heather and I worked at. Now this pro tournament, it was a challenge event that started in Hawaii in 2005 and it was here till 2017. And it was a men's event that um, started off in Waikoloa on the big island and then moved around to Oahu and, it, and in its last four years was here on Maui at the Royal Lahaina Tennis Ranch. And uh, the year that we'll be featuring is 2016. What, what made that year special was that they invited men and women. So it was a draw of 32 in both. And uh, it happened right after the Australian Open. So a lot of players that played, that lost early, came up to Hawaii and played in the tournament before heading back to the mainland. Some of the players that played that year on the men's side were Taylor Fritz, Francis Tiafo, uh, Tennis Sandgren. And on the women's side, just Jessica Pugula, Jen Brady, and Taylor Townsend. Now these players that I just mentioned actually didn't win the tournament. So more on that later. All right, so we're here at the Royal Lahaina Tennis Ranch Pro Shop. Let's go inside. All right, so as you enter the pro shop, this is what you'll see. There's a nice uh, selection of logo apparel right here. There's a nice shirt right here. And in the back of the shop, there's the tennis courts. We'll get to that later, but I did want to show you the stringing area where we used to set up right in this corner. All right, we're sitting here in the area that we would typically set up our stringing station. So you can see that it's a pretty large area. In fact, if it's large, it's large enough where uh, we could set up a nice long table running the length of this wall, pretty much all the way to here. And it was big enough for two laptops. One was for Heather to do her accounting and I had one for my label maker. And we also had a printer in case we needed to uh, print up invoices. And that's where stenciling was done. Pretty much everything to the racket was done there. And then in the middle where we're sitting is where I would have the stringing machine. And then in the front area is where the uh, another table was located where rackets were dropped off and picked up. Then underneath the table, there were uh, about four bins, I think, that went all the way across underneath the table that was hidden from the players, but we could see it, of course. And then, uh, so that's where we'd put all the rackets that were done. The other thing that I think is important, if you don't have it already, is to always make sure you string on an anti-fatigue mat because that really goes a long way with your legs. Um, and again, stringing at a tournament, you really have to endure the long hours. And um, another secret sauce is a five hour energy. That's what I like to use. And um, hand moisturizer at night. That keeps your hands from cracking. I mean, it'll probably still crack, but anything you can do to make your hands last the entire week is always helpful. All right, so we're sitting out here at Stadium Court and did want to talk about the system that we developed for receiving rackets. So typically what we'll do is we'll have signage to explain the payment process. And we like to collect cash and uh, pay as you go. So that works for us. And um, we also have a work order form that um, you'll see in the picture above. And basically it's uh, the player will fill it out when they come to drop off their racket. And I found that it actually works better if the player themselves can work it, uh, can fill it out themselves, assuming that we can read their handwriting. Uh, because in one tournament, there was a player that uh, claimed that he told us one thing, but he wrote it himself. And when he saw the work order form, he realized, oh, I actually wrote a mistake. So anyway, it works out if you can get them to write it, um, write it out themselves. A question that's typically asked that, um, when they drop off racket, they'll ask, uh, are you stringing loose or tight? Uh, another question they might ask is, um, well, can I see that racket over there? I want to test it out. So you'll get those questions asked because they want to know, the pros want to know uh, how you're stringing up based on the machine and maybe the way you're stringing. 
and uh, it's just their way of figuring out what tension they should ask for. But typically, I'll just say my tension is right on. Uh, anyway, the other thing uh, that I think is important is to make sure that after they complete their work order form, that we need to get a date uh, when they want their racket completed by. Uh, if it's before the tournament even starts, then typically they'll want it the next day so they can uh, practice with it. And then from there, they'll figure out what tension they'll go on their next string job. If it's on a day before a tournament, then typically Heather and I will check the uh, order of play and just make sure that we follow that to make sure rackets get to the players before their match starts. Uh, the other thing, and I'll let Heather talk about this, is that when we receive the rackets, uh, sometimes we can get them in batches. Uh, like They typically like to drop them off at the end of the day for some reason, and we never get them uh, on a regular basis. So. Uh, we'll get a whole bunch of rackets and um, I'll let Heather talk about how those rackets are taken in. So the whole entire process of how they get taken in? Yeah, with uh, how you bag them. Okay, so uh, the player comes in and uh, like Albert said, they fill out their work order. Um, but before they even start doing that, they're typically taking their rackets out of their bags and putting them up on the table, uh, deciding which rackets they want strung. Um, and then they'll put the rest back in their bag and they'll take out strings if they haven't dropped off strings already um, And then they'll fill out the work order and I put the rackets and their strings and the work order into a plastic finished bag and Set it aside and take in the next one and we just keep doing that and then I'll have a pile of rackets all bagged with their work orders and their strings um, sitting there and then once it's calm and quiet, I can start entering that into my system so it all uh, gets accounted for. Yeah, what we found works out really well with that system is that because it can get chaotic sometimes, you want to make sure that the strings that they give you is going to be their strings and not somebody else's because a lot of players play with the same string. So we just like to make sure that everything is kept together. So I write their name on it. On yeah. And then uh, prior to me stringing it, uh, Heather will also make sure that she checks the uh, priority. And uh, I'll provide a picture, but she'll typically line them up on a table and have them ready. So I, all I have to do is just get their next racket in line. And uh, yeah, and it's good to go. All right, so next we're gonna talk about the stringing preparation. So I'll let Heather talk about that process. Yeah, I get to destroy the rackets and he gets so I take the strings off. So the old strings, I cut them off with the string string bed cutter. String bed cutter. I cut off the strings and then I pull them out and toss them. And um, then I'll put the racket up on the table along with the work order and that person's strings, the player's strings. And then I enter into uh, his computer for the label maker to print out the label. I put in the player's name, the date that the racket was strung and the time that it was strung. Actually, you put the time that it's supposed to be done by. So she'll estimate about 20 minutes per racket. And sometimes if there's multiple rackets, she'll space about 20 minute intervals. And it's my job to try and either keep up with that time, or in my case, I try to beat the time. He does, yeah. And it's actually, it's motivating for him. It's kind of funny. It is like a game like a game between us and sometimes there's banter that goes on back and forth too it's like what time did you put on that label oh da -da -da -da. oh god <laughs> we gotta speed this up so it is kind of funny so anyway um i get that all lined up so i'll line up like two or three rackets in a row um in the order that he wants them to be strong and then um the other thing that I do when a player drops off a racket, I enter their name into a database and I'll indicate how many rackets they dropped off and how much they need to pay. It's a, the whole accounting system is all in this database. And um, when they pick up a racket and they pay for it, then I mark it paid in the database. And I mark, mark it paid on their work order too, just so we have that backup. Um, and then I can print them a receipt when, when all is said and done. Next is a stringing process. So, uh, like we mentioned earlier, Heather will uh, 
provide the labels, but she doesn't actually stick it on the racket because what I like to do is look at what the racket was, um, where it was previously strung, and I'll provide a picture, and I have a collection of labels, so you might even see your label up there. Make sure you comment below because, um, yeah, I always find it interesting where the rackets came from previously, and uh, so I'll remove that, sorry, but uh, I'll put my own label on, and I'm kind of particular where it goes, so I'll, I'll do that, and then, um, the main thing is uh, during the stringing process, I try to establish a rhythm. So like earlier, met, uh, we mentioned that how Heather does the 20-minute interval, so that keeps me on track. If I ever have to take a break, though, I try to do it in between players' rackets. So I don't do it in, in the middle uh, if there's two or three rackets. I try to just do all at once. Uh, but if I take a break, I try to do it after I finish that player's rackets. Um, other things to make it fun is... Um, I like to pre-arrange the order sometimes because if we're stringing at night and we have to get it done the next day, it really doesn't matter what order. But if I'm stringing a lot of tough rackets, I'll try and make it sure make sure I get the easy ones at the end of night. Or if I'm getting really uh, tired of a certain kind of racket, then I'll just ask Heather, can you just redo those labels because I'm going to change the order. So that makes it fun. Another thing that I've always done is I never like to count how many rackets I've strung. So. It's kind of like a big surprise at the end of the day to see what I actually did. And I will reveal what that record-breaking number was that I um, mentioned earlier in my part one video. Uh, the third thing, and I'm kind of lucky that uh, Heather actually is a pretty good singer, so she can provide some live entertainment sometimes. So that makes it even more fun when she can just do what she does. And uh, it's just the two of us at night, so it's, uh, yeah. And, and that, I mean, we might be there till midnight 1 a.m., 2 a.m., I think as late as 3 a.m. sometimes. <laughs> so, you know, if I can just sing while we're working, I'm happier. <laughs> He's happier. Talk about early morning entertainment. Keeps us awake. All right, so finally we're going to talk about finishing touches. So after I string the racket, it's not done yet. A lot of times the players will request for the rackets to be stenciled. So. That's where I'll either do it or sometimes Heather will take care of that. Mm -hmm. And um, another thing is that um, we'll bag the rackets. Earlier, Heather mentioned that the uh, rackets that come in, uh, when they get bagged, it's not in the, um, it's in a, we're reusing bags, by the way. So we're just putting it in bags like this and that's where the string and the work order goes. But when a racket is completed, then I, I, um, I have my special bags that all the rackets go into. So on each uh, bag, we have a label that matches the uh, label that goes on the racket. So I'll just bring these up and hopefully you can see it. But you can see how they're um, numbered and along with the player's names. Sorry for the wind here, it's shaking. But um, yeah, that's so we can uh, make sure that all the rackets are, uh, we have a record for that. And um, once we get the rackets back, um, I'll let Heather talk about this. Um. So, yeah, usually I'm bagging the rackets and putting that uh, tape on. And then once it's done, I put it in those bins that you saw underneath the table, uh, the drop-off and pick-up table. And they're all alphabetized. And the other alphabetizing that goes on is the player's strings. Remember I said I write their name on? their strings well we alphabetize their strings too so again it's just efficiency it keeps things moving faster um, they'll drop their strings off and we keep them back behind the counter and so we have them ready to use and every time they drop off a racket and then uh, we also wanted to talk about the uh, bags that I was describing now this was back in uh, 2016 so it was still common practice that rackets were wrapped in plastic but in recent years um, environmental issues you know now it's just not a common practice but even back then I was saying let's just you know try to do recycling as much as we can and so we'd encourage the players to recycle their bags so they would bring back a lot of them would bring back their bag when they were done with it and we could use it again if it was in really good shape um, we could use it again on their rackets if it was a little beat up then we'd just use it you know, as we're taking rackets in and just to keep everything organized and separated. All right, so we're gonna do a fun session here, a quick uh, question and answer fun facts. Okay, so fun fact question number one. 
how many rackets total were strung at that tournament? So the total was 344, and of that, the men did 238, and the women did 106. Now, I did get help. Uh, the local pro here, his name is Kaz, uh, of the 300, he did help me string 44 of those rackets. He was invaluable. Okay, um, here's the one that you guys have been waiting for. With bated breath, I'm sure. The record-breaking total racket strung in one day. What was the record-breaking total number of rackets? Okay, well, Heather did say one day. So this was done in 21 and a half hours. Uh, I hit the 50 mark within that time. But what was really tough about that record-breaking day of stringing the most rackets <laughs> is that I, I got an hour and a half sleep and then on the next day uh, had to string another 41 rackets in 18 hours but I did get six hours rest after that. Okay, um, another question that people like to ask, they want to know what are these pro players stringing their rackets at? What tension are they requesting the most? Well, the average would be between 48 to 58, so, uh, but I can tell you that the lowest was at 43 and the highest was at 67. Okay. And then uh, last but not least, rackets strung per player. Who, what players strung the most rackets, men and women, because this was, you know, men and women. So for the men, it was Alex Bolt. He did a total of 20. And for the women, it was Christina McHale, and she did 16. And she was the eventual winner, so that would make sense. But in contrast, the men's winner, his name is Dee Wu, he only strung five rackets during the entire tournament. In today's video, Heather and I shared with you what it's like to string at a pro tournament. We also shared three key aspects on what we feel makes a successful stringing team. One, preparation. Two, developing a system and three, of course, teamwork. Now stringing at a tournament like this is not for everyone. It's quite challenging when you consider the long hours that you're on your feet stringing, two, the lack of sleep, and three, the wear and tear on your hands and your legs. Now you might be thinking, what is the motivation for stringing at a tournament? Well, for me, I feel like a part of me is on the court with the player, and that's motivating for me. Thanks for watching. Happy stringing. And, and let, let your, your strings, strings play. play. Alright, so I thought it would be fun if uh, we do a quick push. Quick push it. One of those quick pushings. Alright. Quick pushing. <laughs> Alright, so we're going to do a fun segment. A question and answer. Uh, fun facts uh, during the tournament. So. Okay, so <laughs> I'm the questioner apparently. No, it's not for everyone. In fact, it's pretty challenging considering the long hours that you're on your feet stringing, uh, the lack of sleep that you're getting, and the amount of, what am I saying on the third one? The lack of sleep that you're getting, the problem is you're not getting sleep. So the lack, uh, of, sleep. The lack of sleep. Now I'm not saying that this kind of stringing is for everyone. In fact, it's quite challenging. And if you don't mind the long hours that you're on your feet stringing, uh, the lack of sleep that you're not getting, Oh, not that, that you're not getting, just the lack of sleep. Now, stringing at a tournament like this is quite grueling. It's... <laughs> All right, that's... I hope you enjoyed today's video. Thanks for watching. <laughs> what the heck? I hope you enjoyed today's video. Happy stringing. <laughs> Whoa, hey, what? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Look at you.